Hey everyone, in this video we will look at how to upgrade your fetch calls to use the async await syntax. This is the modern syntax to deal with asynchronous code and is preferred by many people so it's important that you understand how it works. To understand it we have to look at the traditional syntax first. So I have opened a project here, it's only one button on the page and I've also opened the console. So when I click on the button we want to get users in this example. So the button here, well it's just a button in the HTML, right, so we can select that right here. Right, so let me very quickly do this. Right, I like to uh, append L to the variable name to indicate that a HTML element is stored in there. And then we're going to attach an event listener, right? So here we want to listen for the click event. And when that event occurs, we want to run uh, a function called click handler, which I'm going to create right here. Right, so this function will run when the click event on that button occurs. Let's quickly check this. I'm going to save here. I have live reload. So now when I click on the button, we see two in the console. All right, so let's try getting data from a remote server. So we can use fetch for this, right, fetch. And we only have to specify the address actually for a get request. So we're going to use a service called regress.in. This will give us some fake data. So usually with external APIs, there is the word API in the URL. And then the name of the, the resource that you're interested in. In this case, it's going to be the user's resource. All right, so this is all we need to make a so-called get request. Let's see what we get. So when I now click we get a so-called promise. Now I have a whole video on promises. I recommend that you watch that after this one. We can create promises and we can consume promises. And the vast majority of the time, we only have to consume promises. So here we also only have to consume the promise, right? So fetch here is basically giving us a promise, right? So you can imagine promise and we can consume a promise in two ways. We can tack on dot then, this is the traditional syntax. And these days we can also write a wait in front of the promise, right? So let's continue with the traditional syntax first, right? So we can tag on dot then, and usually it's uh, formatted like this, right? So eventually the server will send back a response and we get access to that in here. We can call that response or just res. Let's see what we get. Right, so now when I click on this, we get a response object. So what's important here is we see the HTTP status code, which is 200. So everything in the 200 range is good. If the HTTP status code is in the 200 range, the OK property here will be true. Otherwise, it will be false. And then we also have our body. And this will actually be the, the data that we're interested in. But it's, a, it's something with a stream. So what happens here is actually that we don't get all of the data initially. Because you can imagine, we could have a lot of data, right? So all the data is, still has to be streamed in here. So what we're going to use here is rest.json. So with this method, we're going to wait until all the, the data has been streamed in and then it will immediately parse the data as JSON because the format that the data will be in will be JSON format. We cannot work with JSON uh, in our JavaScript here. So we need to convert it from JSON to normal JavaScript, right? Now, since we have to wait some additional time until all the data has been streamed in, this method will also give us a promise and we want to return that promise you can tag on another dot then, right? So it's a little bit tricky to understand how these then uh, blocks work. That's one of the reasons why async await is generally preferred, but this is also typically formatted like this. So then in here, we finally get the full data, right? That, that has been completely downloaded and parsed as JSON. So let's log this to see what we get. Okay, so now if I click on this, we get the full data. So this is all of the data. Now, usually we're not interested in everything, right? So I don't, I'm not interested in total pages or, or per page. I'm interested in the actual users and they actually also call it data. So then in here, we, we see all the data, right? All the users, we have to drill down a little bit here. Let's actually try logging um, one of the user's names, right? So I'm gonna say user at index three and we can say first name, right? We should get Eve here. So now if I save here and I click on the button, we get Eve. All right, now very quickly about error handling in the traditional format. Two things can go wrong. For example, when we make the, the, the get call, our internet falls out, there's a network issue. In that case, the promise will be, the promise from fetch here will be rejected. And we can deal with that in a catch block. So we can say dot catch. Right now in the real world, we may want to show an error component or, you know, output a message here. We're just going to log it. 
right? So a network issue uh, means that the, the request response cycle cannot be completed. So then the promise will be rejected here. Now, another thing that can go wrong is, for example, if we try to access a resource that does not exist, right? So in that case, the server will send a response to us, you know, with a 404 error, right? In that case, the, the request response cycle is still completed, right? It's just that the server is letting us know, hey, this resource does not exist. So we can deal with that typically like this. Now, if the OK property, right, remember that one, if that is not OK, well, we can do something with an error component here. We'll just say problem. And then we also want to stop the function here. We do not want to continue here if there is a 404 error or maybe a 500 status code error, right? So 500 is what we get if there is simply, you know, a, a generic error on the server, right? So in that case, the OK property will be false and we go in here and we return here. If you have a return keyword, it will stop the function. If the OK property is true, meaning the HTTP status code is in the 200 range, we continue here. So this is also called a guard clause. Okay, so this is the traditional dot then syntax. And there is nothing, you know, necessarily wrong with this. It's just that it's a bit difficult to understand how these dot to then blocks actually work. And also, if you have multiple fetch calls after each other, things tend to get messy very quickly. So we now have new syntax. I'm going to comment this out so you can see uh, the traditional compared with the new syntax, um, which is going to be async await. Now, async await works the exact same. It's going to do the same thing. It's just that it's a different syntax, right? So people also call this syntactical sugar, right? So we will still have fetch, right? So fetch stays the same here, right? And the URL also stays the same. So remember, fetch gives us a promise, right? So what we get here is basically promise. And we can consume a promise in two ways. So the, the traditional way is dot then. That's what we did here, right? but you can also write await in front of a promise, right? So now we're gonna consume the promise by using await, right? And if you use await, you have to make this an async function, right? So basically you just have to write async here, right? So now we're using async await to consume the promise, right? So we're still working with promises. This is a mistake I often see. People think that we replace promises and this is not the case, right? So fetch still returns a promise. It's just a different way of consuming it, basically. It's, it's a different syntax, but we do the exact same, right? So make sure you check out my video on promises after this one. Okay, so what do we get from this initial fetch call? Well, Previously here, eventually we got a response, right? So let's ignore the error handling for now, but eventually we get some kind of response and it's the same here, right? So eventually this promise will be resolved, right? So we can store the result of that, well, in a variable called res, right? Same as here. And if you remember this response, well, the initial response object does not have the complete body data yet, right? It can take some additional time before we have all of that uh, streamed in. And also we want to parse that as JSON, right? So here we used rest.json, right? So we can do the same here actually. Now, since we have to wait some additional time, this is also asynchronous code, right? So we actually also get a promise here, right? So you can imagine promise. Now we can say, oh, wait, in, we can in front of a promise, right? So we can do the same here. We can say await. And the result of this will be data, right? So just like here. Right, and what do we want to do with the data? Well, let's just try logging the same thing and let's see if we get Eve again. So I'm going to log this, right? So data.data index three first name. So now if I save this, we should get the same result in the console. And indeed, we see Eve again, right? But now we're using async await. All right, then very quickly, how do we deal with errors in this case? What if there is a network issue, which will cause the promise here to reject? Well, we also have a try catch statement in JavaScript. And this is its own thing, but people typically use this in conjunction with uh, async await. So here, um, in, if you put code in a try block, if a promise is rejected, we go in the catch block here, right? So it's very similar to dot catch, right? So let's just do the same thing here. Okay, and then the second thing is when the request response cycle is still completed, but for example, we try to get a resource that does not exist, right? So you get a 404 error or maybe something else went wrong on the server and we get a 500 status code error, right? So in that case, the okay property on the response object will be false, right? So what we could do is this. If the okay property is false, 
we you know you can output a message on the page but here we'll just log something and and then we could return here and you could run it like this but what people typically do more often is they actually put it after data let me actually add some space here as well right so now if you write it in this uh, sequence we are still going to parse the response as json even if the okay property is not true right because we're only checking for that here and the reason for this is you know let's say we get a 404 error the server will, st will still send back a response and usually that response is going to have like a message like a description of what's the problem right right and that should still be in json format we also want to parse the response body data as json right in that case right so in both cases when everything goes right and when something is wrong, we still want to parse the body data like this, right? So then here, if the OK property is false, you know, maybe the server has sent back um, a description, right? So we can say data.description. Right, so this is actually a little bit better, and this is easier to do here with this syntax than with, than here in dot then. Right, another reason for using async await. Okay, so I'm going to remove this here, and I'm going to uh, put it side by side so you can uh, pause the video if you want to study that for uh, a little bit longer. Okay, so this was for a GET request. So very quickly, how does this work for a POST request, right? So let's say we have a new user. Let's say we want to submit this user to the server, right? So then the button should be SUBMIT USER. Right, and if we want to submit data, we cannot use a GET request. We we should use a POST request. Right, so it stays the exact same, but uh, we have to add an additional argument here, an object with some uh, options. So here, the method, the HTTP method, the default is GET. Right, so we don't have to specify that if you want to make a GET request because that's the default. But here, we want to we want to make it a POST request. We want to add something to this resource. Right. And since we're going to submit data, we also need to let the server know what the format of the data will be. And we do this with headers. So here we have to specify one header, the content type. And it's going to be in JSON format, which is in the application category. Now you cannot write an, an object key with a hyphen like this. So people typically wrap this in quotation marks. And then after headers, the actual data in the body that we want to submit. Right, so this is new user, this isn't JavaScript object. Right? But remember the, the format that computers use to exchange data is JSON. Right? So we should convert this to JSON format. Right? We can do that with json.stringify. Okay, so this is how we can submit data. Now, one other thing we should change here is, well, the server may send back a response, right? Like a success message, right? So let's see here, we are not getting this data again, right? So with the get request, we got this data, but now we're, we're just going to get something else, right? So we're not really interested in what the server sends back in this case but whatever it will be let's just log that here right and if something goes wrong well the server will sit, will still send back a message with you know a description or at least that's what the server should do right so this is an example of how you could do it with post so let's actually try that i'm not sure if this service actually uh, works like that okay so they actually do work like that and they actually send back the um the object that you submitted right and they even add an id and a created add uh, property right so this works okay so that's a post request how about a put request so with put we want to update or replace one particular resource right or sub resource right so users is the resource here but we have to specify which particular user right so usually you have to add something for example the user with id 33 right so this is the the sub resource that we want to update or replace so when you send a put request then the server will understand that the that the goal here is to replace this user with the new data that we're sending here right new user and i think this service here does not uh, has not implemented this right so that's this is an example of put and then delete is a little bit easier so with delete, we still have to specify which particular resource, sub-resource we want to delete. But now we're not going to send data, right? We're, we want to delete data so we can remove the headers and the body here, right? So we don't need this anymore either, right? So this would be a delete request with async await. All right, let me quickly change this back to the get request. 
Yeah, so this is the, the get request. Now there's a lot to improve here. We can make this much more sophisticated and professional. And that's something that you will learn by going through my professional JavaScript course, in which we will build two beautiful real world projects from scratch, step by step. So check that out if you're interested. In any case, thanks for watching, hope it was helpful. And I recommend that you continue with the promises video.